And we're live. Hello and welcome to Beecraft Live, um, our monthly hangout. Uh, my name's Rodri, as most of you probably know, I'm a familiar face on this now, um, and I'll be hosting tonight's hangout. Um, tonight we're joined by several experienced beekeepers uh, and members of the Beecraft team. We've got Wendy and Stephen, who I'm sure most of you know, and we'll hopefully be joined by uh, somebody else very shortly. Um, tonight we're going to keep the topic to the spring builder. Um, it's been a very strange year. Um, it seems to have gone on and on and on. It's been it's been a never-ending cold winter. And only last weekend, when we had that warm spell, did I manage to go through a few colonies myself. Um, and it seems in South Wales, where I am, the bees are around about four to six weeks behind this year. So I'm, I'm sure others will uh, bring their sort of regional variation into the conversation to see how things are developing across the UK and possibly uh, globally as well. So. Well, we've had a, a few questions uh, before the Hangout, um, and we're going to try our best to answer them. But don't forget, if you're watching via the Beecraft website, then below my face, there's a little box which um, you can ask a question directly, and it'll come through to us, and we'll uh, we'll open it up to the panel. So uh, I'll open it up to the panel now for everyone to introduce themselves. Um, if you could say who you are, what you do within Beecraft, and what, are you, what have your bees been doing over the winter, and more importantly, over the last couple of weeks in the warm weather that we've had. So, Wendy, do you want to go first? Okay, ladies I'll first. go first. Ladies, ladies first, how gentlemanly. Um, <laughs> looking after the Queen in the colony, eh? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Um, right, um, I'm responsible for marketing within Beecraft, and uh, I had the opportunity as well, Rodri, of going into some of our hives um, just over, over the weekend. And... I was actually quite surprised because they are opposite, um, very close, just opposite side of the road to a field of oilseed rape, which is actually now pretty much out in full bloom. And I went into the hives and actually there's not a huge amount going on. It's just so cold still. And whereas I expected to find you know, much more activity, we didn't find any hives that had uh, full um, brood box um, with seal brood. We did see the queens in all of them, um, which was that's a really nice thing to do. So we were able to mark one that was unmarked. So that's terrific. Um, but really quite surprised at how slow things are because we went armed with supers just in case and um, not one of them was needed. So, you know, things are very slow. And of course, if the weather's not warm enough, then they're just not going well, to, to get out onto the oil seed rape either. Um, Richard joined us now. Hello. <laughs> I would just, um, just like to say, actually, that one of our colleagues in Norfolk uh, is, uh, has told me that her bees are absolutely going manic on um, oil seed rape to the point she's actually moving some into the city to get away from the from the oil seed rape so um, it's varying considerably throughout the country um, and I, mean, I suppose that's to do with the weather you know as most of you probably know I, I do a bit of uh, migratory beekeeping and I move some hives down to Roos by Cardiff airport and the oil seed rape has only very recently come into flower down there so it's yeah, yeah. It's a lot of variation. How about yourself, Stephen? Well, I had a very strange experience because I went away on holiday three months ago. At, uh, sorry, about five weeks ago. And because things happen so quickly here, I put on some supers. I put on some supers when the snow was on the ground. <laughs> it felt very silly indeed. But I thought it's better that than coming back to uh, a, a brood box brimming with bees and an early swarm. <laughs> and as it happened, uh, they didn't need a super until about a week or so ago. Uh, the oilseed rape is now in full flow, and I, I, I don't actually have bees in the garden for the first time in several years. So I've got to rectify that very soon. So I'm not quite sure how they've been doing over the past couple of days, but clearly things are picking up very, very quickly. And uh, we'll see what happens. I, I'm hearing a, a little bit about some swarms here and there, but mine certainly aren't at that stage. Uh, they've got between about four and ten sides of brood each, eight colonies, all eight came through. Uh, two of them I didn't really want to come through because they weren't they're a bit tetchy, but they did come through. Uh, and just one needed feeding. So uh, it's looking good for the season here. 
Whereabouts are you in the UK, do you say, sorry? I am Northern Hampshire. That's halfway between Newbury and Basingstoke. I'm sorry, I'm Stephen Fleming and I'm deputy editor of Beecraft. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> Would you like to give an introduction, Richard? Um, I don't know if you've had opportunity to look at your hives yet. Um, if you could give us a feel for how they're developing so far. I can, yes, of course. Um, so I'm in Wiltshire, uh, which is normally, we're blessed with pretty pretty good conditions, generally, weather-wise, in my particular spot. Um, but this year, I, I didn't open any hives until a fortnight ago, the first time I opened them. Um, and it took them, can you still see me? Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, something's popped up, but some, some, somebody wants me to donate some money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, two weeks ago was the first time I opened them. And generally, they, they're developing uh, pretty well, but much later than I would normally expect. The oil seed rape started flowering here um, about a fortnight ago, but really only got going last week with those two days, with those two very hot days we had when everything came out. <clears throat> Uh, and I put some supers on, um, probably rather too late actually, but I checked them today and one colony has filled two supers already. Uh, really? Yeah. Um, and they, they're going to have a third super on them tomorrow, um, which is probably mostly um, oilseed rape, but a lot of things are flowering um, simultaneously this year. So, for example, very near my hives, there's some woodlands around the edge, in fact, of a field of oilseed rape, and there's a lot of wild cherry there and field maple um, and that's blooming beautifully at the moment and in fact <clears throat> when I went to look at the oilseed rape uh, both of those trees had a lot of honeybees on them so it's quite nice to know that whatever's coming in isn't isn't just rape um, but they they the, the colonies aren't as big as I would normally like them to be right now because I do like to take advantage of the oilseed rape um, but there's a lot of brood in there. Um, in about two weeks' time, there'll be a lot of bees, and I think the rape will still be flowering <clears throat> then. Um, so if the weather holds, I think I'll have a lot of honey coming in from that. I must say, I'm quite envious then, because uh, mine seem uh, quite far behind uh, over here. Um, most of the colonies are on about six frames of brood, and they're definitely not at the stage where they need a super yet. It's uh, uh, same it's sure the variation. Well, I'm only, I'm only talking about probably a third of my colonies that are at, at that stage. The rest are still, um, you know, a little bit behind for this time of year. <coughs> I, do, um, I do try to get them ready for the oil seed rape, and so I do normally like to have larger colonies by now. Um, if we didn't have rape and I relied on a, a later flow, then, you know, then I would be quite happy with the, the colonies being slower. Mm. What were the dandelions doing around where you are? Because uh, I know in the warm weather we had, it was uh, it was all barren out there, and then all of a sudden it was a sea of orange and yellow. Yeah, they're glorious here at the moment, mm. especially along the roadsides. Until the council sees them, they'll come. <laughs> yes. Pieces. But the um, uh, interestingly, even the colonies that um, are bringing in a lot of nectar, a large amount of which I would say was rape, most of the pollen that's going in is dandelion. Mm -hmm. Right, well, if we uh, we'll have a look at some of the questions which we've received now, and quite aptly, there's one on oilseed rape, so we'll go straight to that one. Uh, it's off Helen Walkington, and she's asked, my colonies are slow to recover from winter, so very small. The oilseed rape is nearly ready, close by. Uh, is there any danger my bees will fill the brood box with honey that's going to set solid? How can I stop this from happening without negatively impacting on the expansion and need for food? Quite a long question, so should I open it up to the floor? And if you want me to repeat it, uh, feel free to say. Wendy, do you want to start? I, neither one, none of us wants to answer <laughs> the that all seems right, do we? Um, I would be concerned actually as well, um, but I guess it, you know, small colonies. I, I don't know. I, I would rather listen to Stephen and Richard on this one because. I have very little experience of oilseed rape, to be honest. Um, once about five years ago, and I'm going, some of my bees are very close, as I said, are very close to it now. So um, I would welcome hearing what they've got to say about it as they have more experience of it. Well, I, I found that I've, I've never found trouble with the brood box having solid honey within it. <clears throat> but you turn within the super on a few occasions. 
Um, I don't, what's your experience, Richard and Stephen? Well, firstly, um, because of the temperatures down in the brood box, if you've got plenty of bees, the oil seed rate won't necessarily set um, or s that quickly. Um, you, you know, you, you're often you'll find, for example, that <clears throat> with the warmth in the colony, if you take a super of oil seed rape off and it's capped, but it's um, liquid, just the act of taking it away from the warmth of the hive will be enough to set it very quickly. So um, I wouldn't be too worried about it setting um, in the brood box. Also, um, the, the weather's warm enough for the bees to get out and get plenty of water. So if they set honey in there, they will be able to um, soften that honey up and, and make use of it. Um, the other thing about oil seed rape is <clears throat> it's a really good time to get more wax drawn. So um, you can always remove um, a good number of your older frames, brood frames, and put foundation in there, and they'll use the um, oil seed to, uh, nectar to, um, to build a nice new foundation for you, which you can then use if you're raising nukes or, or for whatever purposes or just replacing some of the older combs. So I, <clears throat> I really don't think that um, oil seed rape in the brood box is, is anything to worry about at all. <clears throat> I'm going to put my chin on that. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get back here. Yeah. I think you've got a little bit of an echo going on there. So. Yeah, okay. I, I wouldn't worry about it because the oil seed rate will tend to go to the outside of the brood nest anyway. And you'll probably want the brood nest to expand, so put in some foundation at an appropriate time when the flow's really going, and, and you'll be you'll be fine. I, I can't ever remember having a problem with oilseed rape setting in in the spring in the brood box. Good, good. I, th I think that's answered the question. Um, um, if, if you'd like to ask anything more, Helen, please please feel free to uh, ask some further questions. If I could uh, just, Rod, go on, just yeah. say, Rod, I had uh, one of one of our hives was um, was quite small, the uh, one on the oilseed rape, and what we did just to give them a bit of extra warmth because it's still cold here is put the varroa tray in um because we operate on open mesh floor and putting the varroa tray in will actually help to to keep the bees a little bit warmer and help hopefully help their development it's funny you say that interesting i've i've made a you know you know i like to experiment with my beekeeping i've decided to trial half my colonies on this year on solid floors so that i found them does tend to aid their development. They, they seem to help to maintain the, the temperature in the hive, I suppose. So, yeah. I think I'll let you know the outcome of that experiment. So. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think sometimes it's um, you can tell if a colony actually needs a little bit of extra help, and that bit of extra warmth makes quite a bit of difference to them. Because um, I would agree, we've we've seen uh, a better build up sometimes um, when they're small. Mine are all on open mesh floors, but I didn't remove the um, inserts from them until just before that hot period we had a couple of weeks ago. And I didn't remove any insulation until then. Mine all have a big slab of um, Silatex, you know, the king spans that are damaged. Mm. That on. You know, that would normally here, I would take that off in about February. Um, but I've kept that on. That extra bit of heat, I think, is. is, mm. is I, I know Wendy uses polystyrene hives, and I know my polystyrene hives are much more advanced than the wooden equivalent um have you found a similar thing do, do you run poly hives richard or stephen no. i don't at the moment I, I do have one waiting in the wings which i'm hoping to use this year um i do have um several poly nukes um and i well this year i bought the nukes i bought through the winter half probably in poly and half um in wooden nukes and actually i haven't noticed a difference Mm. Um, and they, they, in fact, my wooden nukes aren't even even wooden nukes. They're, it's um, they're made of plywood. It's actually not very thick, so the insulation isn't that great. But I don't seem to have problems with them. But we are, I'm in quite a sheltered spot where I keep those nukes. Um, but I'm hearing, as you said, a lot of people are saying that their colonies, um, full size colonies in polystyrene um, hives, are uh, you know ahead. You don't and I think that seems to be where a lot of people are shifting to now is moving over to the polystyrene hives for, for that reason, I think. It's, uh, I know most beekeepers you speak to at local associations are tending to go down that route. Interesting. I, I don't use polys and, and actually I'd be a bit frightened to do so because one of my major problems is I've got quite prolific bees and it's going to bring them on even earlier and I don't mm. particularly want that. 
Uh, so I, I've, I've kept away from polys today. I should experiment with them, but I, I just think that it's going to create more problems for me in this area. Yeah. <laughs> we go to our next question then from Fiona. Um, and Fiona has asked, as the colonies are only just picking up uh, and are at least a month behind the usual swarming season, does that mean we can expect to manage swarming until the end of August? I know we're definitely way away from swarming season this year, um, in uh, South Wales anyway. Yeah. Six weeks away, so. Well, I've, I've, done, I've had to do two artificial swarms already. Um, really? Yeah, and Stephen's already thinking, well, that's what happens if you encourage large colonies <laughs> uh, and it's true um you know i do manage my bees to take advantage of the rape and that does lead to problems with um, with more swarming at this time if, if, the, if the weather's wrong last year was terrible um the colonies got really big and just in time for the rape and then the rape came out a bit early and then we had rain for three weeks and the colonies all swarmed um but uh, what was the question uh, the question was, uh, will the swarming, swarming season be longer this year? Can we expect it to, to last until August? Well, I, I would say that just depends on how quickly the weather picks up and how long it lasts and whether it's actually going to be a good summer um, at the end of this horrible winter. Well, looking out the window at the moment, it's just started raining. It's bitterly cold again. So, so. Yeah. My feeling, my feeling on the matter is that, that although everything's late, things have a habit of, of catching up, um, particularly um, the situation in the hives with the bees. And um, I think, you know, if, if we now get into a relatively normal pattern of weather, normal for spring and early summer, I think things will even out. And I think we'll probably find that things happen more or less on the, on the normal sort of schedule. Bees can, of course, swarm at any time um, until quite late. I've even had them in September. So... Um, you know, you can never really relax. But I, w I would think that now things are normalising. Um, I suspect that swarming will probably be fairly normal. Mm. The books will tell you that there's two swarming uh, times, the biggest one being in spring and the later one being in, in summer. And I, I very often find swarming problems in August only when there's been a poor mating, uh, poor mating weather in the spring when the queen hasn't made it properly and they don't really want to take her into winter. And so they have another go. Um, but yeah, I think you can always expect to find a few swarms in August. Anyway, it's the best part of beekeeping, isn't it? Chasing <laughs> swarms and a bit of swarm control. <clears throat> uh, have you found any drones at all in your inspections? Um, I know I, in one colony I found one, I think. So it's, uh, plenty of drone brood, but nothing, nothing out and about yet. No, I haven't seen any drones at all. Uh, I, I think I've probably got drones in all my colonies, and some of them have got quite a few. Really? I've just got drone brood, but I haven't looked since last weekend, uh, so things could well have changed. But it was probably they're about to emerge, I would think. It's amazing that that regional variation. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we've got somebody who's, who's uh, it asked that exact thing actually. Um, John has just said it's my first hangout, uh, but in year six of beekeeping. So, hello, John. Um, he's asked, Are all your experts in the south? Uh, here in north of Yorkshire, it's rather different. As I should imagine, it is much colder yes. up there. I'm very yes. flattered to be called an expert. That's the first thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> I'm, in north, I'm in North Devon, so um, about eight miles. As the crow flies, I think, from um, where the Woolacombe Asian hornet was found last year. So um, that's probably one of my concerns. Um, but um, nothing's seen so far. And that's, a, that's a separate topic, anyway. And, and I'm about eight miles from where the Tetbury uh, hornet was found with the very first one. Um, so, and again, that was, that's been a, a concern. Yeah. Luckily, I'm across the Bristol Channel, so <laughs> well away from it. So. They came across the English one. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> John has asked another question as well, actually. Um, he says, I have a colony with brood in all stages and eggs in a normal pattern, but in one frame where brood has emerged already, there are cells with multiple eggs. Are all the eggs the same age 
All the eggs are the same age and are at the bottom of the cell in a regular pattern. There was no drone brood anywhere, and it's a 2017 queen. What's the problem? Whoa. Uh, I would... Oh, that's a difficult one. I mean, multiple eggs normally is either a young queen who hasn't quite got up to speed, laying rather too many, or, or laying workers. Um, and neither of those should be the, the issue here. Um, it's too early, I would have thought, for, for them to have superseded. I mean, he needs to he needs to know that the queen that he thinks is in there is the queen he thinks she he's got. Mm. Uh, if it was later in the year, I would say perhaps they've superseded the queen and, and you've had a sort of fairly seamless takeover. And you've got a new young queen in there and she is laying multiple eggs while she gets up and running. Uh, may, does it depend, might it depend on how late in the year the new queen was put into the colony? Might it be that she is still fairly fairly new when she went into winter and therefore is still getting getting to grips with it? Having said that, um, we did say that the brood had already emerged. So you've, you've, the queen have been fine. Uh, I'd be interested to know if there are any cells um, which still just have a single egg. Um, uh, so that we know that there is a queen laying, apparently normally. Mm. Um, we said there's, there's brood in all stages and eggs in a normal pattern, but in the one frame where the brood has emerged, there's multiple eggs in the cell. It seems very specific to one frame. I wonder how far that frame is from the main brood nest or whether it's part of the main brood nest. You know, just in case it was a, a a laying worker elsewhere, I've never seen that, but I'm just trying to try for an explanation. If you're watching us live, John, feel free to ping through some additional information. And I'll put the team on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it was later in the year. My my hunch would be that you, they've superseded the queen, and and uh, so your previous queen supplied the the healthy brood, the normal brood that you've got, and your new young queen. Um, has, has started laying, but she's laying multiple eggs. But I think that seems unlikely at this time of year. Yeah. Oh, yes. Are there any drones around in where his hive is that would have mated with a, a, a new queen this year? I think I think the piece of information I'm most likely to know is, does he know that he has got his original queen in, in, in there? Has he seen her? Mm. Um, but even so, I, that wouldn't immediately um give us any great clues as to what's happening difficult one <laughs> photographs i'd love you to send us some photographs john here we are john there's your challenge email some photographs through and we'll have a look <laughs> yeah we'll continue to you know if you can keep us updated with any information and developments and we'll have we'll have a th further think about it excellent, excellent. Ah. Well, we've got a, a fellow uh south Walian here alan from carmarthenshire um he's he's asked having checked my bees for the first time on wednesday um i found that the pollen patty i put in last year has not been fully eaten um they've left half of it should i take it out as the bees are now bringing bringing in pollen yellow and orange in color um only one hive four frames of wood so he's left a pollen patty on the hive it's been half eaten should he remove it now the bees are out collecting uh, pollen I would say yes. Yeah. If, if, there's, if he knows there's plenty of pollen coming in, uh, then fresh pollen is going to be better than anything that, that can be in a pollen patty, I would have thought. In, in my experience, they will only use pollen patties if they can't get um, fresh pollen of their own. And, and once pollen is available, they will stop using pollen patties if you've given them to them. So I would take it out and um, wrap it up and use it again on that same hive. Um, if you feel um you know if we get another bout of bad weather and they don't get out for a little while and you're worried about them um i suppose it depends I actually, if you're... sorry go on yeah. i was just gonna say I, I i i've only used pollen patties uh once i think in an experimental way um <clears throat> even this year when we've had a long period without any pollen around i didn't use them um uh, because generally there is plenty of pollen in most places um available it's something i've never used I, i've never found the need to be honest we, we've always got a 
an excess of pollen here. Um, how about yourself, Wendy, Stephen? Have you tried them? Or? Uh, I've never tried them. As I say, my bees come on very, very quickly anyway, so that's the reason I haven't tried them. But I think it is interesting. It's going to vary from area to area. And one of the findings that's coming out from the research at the moment is, is the importance of pollen, early season pollen, and the variation. Not all pollen is of the same quality. And therefore, even though you've got a lot of pollen coming in, there could be areas that you'd still be, uh, you'd want to boost your bees before that all starts because the pollen might not have that high a protein content. Uh, the, the research is very much live on this. Very interesting indeed. And uh, we wait to see where it goes over the next year or two. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I've That's never used um, pollen patties, so I can't pass comment on their efficacy. Um, if they're needed, if the, the bees need them, then they've got to, to have some pollen from somewhere, haven't they? And if it's not available um, where you are, then uh, I'm a bit surprised because I would, I would imagine there's plenty of pollen around now. Um, but I've, as I say, I have no experience of the patties. John has just uh, emailed with some more details. So I'm going to put the experts on the spot now. So, uh, <laughs> right. He said, there's lots of normal eggs. No recent emerged queen cell, or I should assume that's no recent emerged queen. Um, queen seen and okay. Um, this frame is the last on the brood nest, but normal eggs on the outer facing side on the edge. Um, and on another subject, he has pollen coming out of everywhere. Uh, this frame's covered in it. So. I'm going to make a guess here. I think that. <clears throat> the existing queen's pheromones really aren't going that far and there's a laying worker right on the edge of the brood nest that's being allowed to get away with it. Uh, I've never heard or seen that before so it's just a guess. Richard? I, I, similarly I've no experience of that or I have heard anything but that is the only explanation that I can that I can think of. It's really the location as you say the location of those eggs. Um, you could try um, spreading the brood you know a little bit perhaps moving that frame slightly further in um and seeing what happens i would be surprised if you do that if the rest of the workers don't find those eggs and and remove them and do something about the layer so what would you say the solution to that is then is said just just leave them be now and they sort themselves out and remove the laying worker or sort of intervene well it would to me it would suggest that the, as exactly as stephen said the queen isn't um isn't producing enough um of the pheromones um and if that's the case then you you may have problems with that queen and they may well decide to supersede her perhaps they're waiting until there are enough drones around and they may then replace her of their own accord in this sort of situation because we don't know what's going on i would be reluctant to interfere and just enjoy seeing what happens next because that's the fun of beekeeping Let's see what the bees do and how they cope with that. And watch out for an early swarm because, as Richard says, you know, they may just be waiting for the drones and they say, we've had enough of this queen. We need a, a, a stronger queen. Uh, watch out for early queen cells. But, um, you know, keep an eye on things and keep us up to date because I think we're probably all very interested in this case. <laughs> I think we're all very perplexed as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this kind of thing happens all all the time we have question and answer sessions at our local association and almost every time someone throws a spanner in the works with some question that just stumps us all um as stephen said that's the that's the fun and the joy of beekeeping well, that's the beauty of it you're constantly learning it's constantly evolving isn't it so yeah, yeah. we've got another question from fiona and fiona's asked I continue to feed my bees fondant until the recent hot spell. When I checked my bees last week, the bees had stored the fondant in the cells. So it looks like white substance in the cells. Shall I leave it for them to eat? Hmm. I've not come across bees storing fondant before. They normally um, consume it straight away. So it, it may not be fondant. It might be, uh, you know, could be perhaps the remains of some ivy honey or something like that. Um, but either way, I wouldn't have thought it was anything to worry about. I think they'll probably sort it out themselves and consume it and rearrange it and 
as long as it's a healthy colony, I think they will probably sort out the, um, the comb themselves. Is there anything around at the moment that would be giving white pollen? It could be pollen instead of um, honey. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, especially if it's, um, you know, they've packed it down with a bit of honey, which can make it, make it glisten. But I can't think of anything at the moment. Um, you know, we've had the hazel, which produces a sort of, can produce a sort of grey kind of pollen. Um, so what do you think, Stephen? I really don't know. It sounds sounds very strange. Uh, again, I've never seen them store food away before processing it. Oh. So it seems it seems pretty unlikely. Um, yeah. Couldn't possibly be some very early old seed rate. We don't know where the person is. Uh, if they're very far south, it could conceivably be some very fast crystallizing old seed rate. But I don't really think that either. But it's something I couldn't completely rule out. Yeah. If, uh, if she's in the Somerset area, I know a couple of weeks ago on the way up to um, the BBKA convention that the fields in Somerset were in full bloom then when, when ours were only just starting here. So mm -hmm. if they were that far ahead, that's a possibility that it's um, oil seed rape in the, in the cells. But I, I mean, as far as fondant goes, my understanding was that they would never put that into the cells, that if they fondant they will take if they need to eat it but they won't take it and store it is that right yes yeah i think mm. um yeah i think stephen is possibly correct with the um um the all seed rape or as i said it could be the remains of ivy from the um from the autumn it um, could I be sorry richard yes it could be and it's just been on cat Mm. So it looks a bit different because it's been uncapped because they're looking for stores. Yeah, if they uncap it, it will begin to absorb um, moisture and it'll start to glisten and look look damp um, again. So it, it could be that. Um, either way, I don't think it'd be anything I'd be very concerned about. Am I right in thinking that sort of pure ivy honey is very sort of um, granulates with a square structure, doesn't it? So you might be able to identify if it's ivy honey. Well, if you want to know if it's like ivy honey, the best thing to do, um, and make sure you do it in a safe way, is to just give it a good sniff. <laughs> make sure there aren't bees in that bit of comb when you put your nose close to it, even if you've got a veil on, because um, you might end up with a very sore nose. Um, <laughs> give it a smell. If you know, if you know what ivy honey smells like, you smell smell it. Um, I've been, I had some honey stored in our garage a while ago, ivy honey, and I was told it made our garage smell like a public urinal, so that's a hint as to what it can smell like. So I've actually got a jar of what I believe is ivy honey here from a few years ago, which I entered into a honey show. So it's, um, but it's liquid, is it still? Sorry? Liquid? It is, yes, yeah. I recently warmed it. So. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> what colour is it? It looked very dark there. It is. Yeah. It is extremely dark, right? Beautiful honey is one of my favourites. <laughs> oh right, uh, you can have all of mine. Hey, how much do you need? <laughs> oh, yes, please. <laughs> one year I made some mead. Somebody said oh, it makes lovely mead, so I made this mead, and um, about a year later, it still tasted disgusting. And um, I, I think it's an acquired taste, isn't it? And I said, you need to let it mature. Give it another year, and another year later, it was still horrible. And another year after that, it was still so it went down the drain eventually. But it sat under my desk for about three years <laughs> uh, apparently in germany they use it to make gingerbread oh really hmm. well fiona's just replied actually she's from guildford i don't know so. okay well mm. if right, i've got bet. a nice question here no, really no, actually, just, if she's near guildford i know another beekeeper near guildford who gets a lot of uh honey from um, Himalayan balsam which I believe sets uh, very finely but to a very a very clear a pure kind of white so it could be the remains of um, Himalayan balsam from from last autumn just a thought so the message is scratch and sniff yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> well there we are Fiona there's your task you can let us know what it smells like <laughs> Uh, right, we've got a question from Ricky, and he's a he's a new beekeeper. He's asked, "What is bee bread?" Should I open that. Just bee who, bread. Who would like to take that one? Should be a nice, easy one to answer. <laughs> Who's going? 
Okay. Oh, yes. Stephen, I don't want. <laughs> Beaver Red is the um, when the bees pack pack pollen into the um, into cells and they preserve it um, with some um, honey and other enzymes, and it's effectively effectively pickles the um, pollen and makes it last um, a long time. So it's their way of preserving pollen for future use. It does. Um, uh, degrade to a degree the some of the protein content of the pollen i believe but it does allow it to be stored for quite some time there we go and john has just come back and he, he's going to watch the queen and see what happens so mm -hmm. i think he's taking your advice there so uh, yep so john please let us know what the outcome is and we've got a question from martin it's not exactly about spring build-up it's about um varroa so which is something we all have to be aware of and he's asked I've read a lot on Varroa, but no mention of the queen ever being infected, which would be detrimental both to the colony and Varroa. Is she immune? Who would like to take that question? I would say that the, um, the female Varroa, because she needs to go into an open cell um, to lay her eggs, and therefore the larvae feeds the um the bee larvae actually feeds the small varroa as they um, emerge that it would not be appropriate for a varroa to actually be on a queen yeah i i, I suspect that um you know through evolution they know that there's not much point being on a queen but they're very mobile um, within the colony they'll hop from one bee to the other um, I have seen a varroa on a queen, um, and I did panic when I saw it, but the next time I saw the queen, there was no sign of a varroa, so I think it probably just hopped on her temporarily. As, as mm -hmm. Wendy says, they want to be, um, when they're in the phoretic stage, which is the stage when they're ca catching a lift on the bees, um, what they really want to do, well, there's, either, there's two things they want to do. They either want to go out of the hive with the bee um, and then hop off the bee onto a flower and then hop onto another bee when she visits the flower, um, so that they can go and infest another colony. And there's some very uh, interesting video of that on YouTube. I can't quite remember the name of the channel, but you can see a little varroa running around and hiding under a petal. And then when the next bee comes along, uh, the varroa hops hops onto the bee. Um, uh, but what they really want to do, of course, in your colony is, is to um, infest um, cells with, with developed larvae in them. So um, I suspect that if there's a varroa, if you see a varroa on a queen, she's they're probably not going to be there for very long because it probably just there's nothing in it for them. I think she'd be very quickly groomed off anyway. And also they're, they're very unlikely to go on queen cells, or at least the queen cells very unlikely to be allowed to develop if there's a, uh, a varroa in there. I suspect the bees are, are going to be super alert to that. And so the, the drone, the, the varroa are going to go into the drone route uh, almost, almost always. Uh, the queen's too short uh in in her creation to allow development of the varroa mites and then they're going to if, if they end up on her i've never seen a varroa on a queen bee but as richard says it may happen but i suspect they'd be groomed off pretty smart mm. yeah. no that's great was, was, i can't remember was the question that he had actually seen a varroa on the queen or just that he hadn't heard of that happening i'll just double check Uh, no, it wasn't that he'd seen one, it's just he, he hadn't heard of it happening. So what does uh, the rest of the spring hold for all of you then? Um, I know I'm hoping for some nice warm weather now, looking outside it's still raining. Um, and then carry on with some inspections, see how the colonies are developing and prepare for swarming, I suppose. Um, what, what's your plans for the next few weeks and what, what sort of thing will you be looking out for as the bees start to develop at this time of year? We start with Richard and work across. Uh, well, uh, again. as you as you said, I really get ready for swarming, so I'm making sure I've got plenty of bear boxes and nukes and what have you. Really, that's quite important. Not not being um, caught off guard. Um, and really, for the next few weeks, at least I would have thought the next three weeks, um, it's really trying to keep an eye on on the oilseed rape and what's coming in and what the situation there is. Um, and keeping an eye on what's um, a close eye on what else is developing by way of um, trees and other flowers. 
Um, I think Stephen had said you'd spoken to an agronomist who thought that the the beans might be flowering early this year, um, which you know there normally is a bit of a gap between the oilseed rape and the beans, which allows you to get off the oilseed rape and get them ready for the beans if you've got them in the area. So that's something to think about. Um, and then I shall be thinking about before very long uh, queen rearing, so identifying um, which queens um, I would like to. Um, to breed from um, and thinking about um, um, how I'm going to do that, what method. Excellent. Uh, Stephen? I'm looking forward to free lunch. Uh, swarm chasing, uh, I, I love that. That's what I really look forward to. When you get called out into all sorts of different places and last year I got called out into the centre of Newbury uh, to a restaurant and got a free meal as a result, which is very nice. <laughs> So I'm, I'm looking forward to see where, where they appear this year. Uh, I'm also, the annoying bit about this time of year for me is having to time the extraction of that first oilseed rape, the spring crop, uh, because you've got to watch when the fields are going over, just turning, when that yellow starts to turn to green, getting the honey off pretty quickly then and extracting it. And that means organising my work life around that. Uh, that's that's a frustrating bit, but I'm really looking forward to the swarming season. I love that. Both both trying to trying to control the swarming, which is always good fun, and you never win. That's why it's such good fun, and and collecting other swarms. I know one of my tasks will be setting up my uh, annual voicemail, which sort of filters out all the swarm calls. <laughs> and, uh, I'll, I'll just add for new inspired. beekeepers out there. Here here's a here's something that will really surprise you. I think. Uh, these days, if I get half a dozen swarm calls a year, I'm very happy because that's quite a few. In 1995, just before Varroa hit this area, it was a very warm spring leading up to it. And on the first May Day bank holiday weekend, the local council took more than 100 swarm calls. Great. <laughs> Now that seems inconceivable today, mm. but it just shows you how many feral colonies there were around in those days when Varroa was just beginning to get hold. Never seen the like of that since, and never expect to see the like of that again. Uh, but it's a, a it's a nice bit of uh, nice bit of beekeeping history. That's what beekeeping might have been like pre Varroa. Great. Mm. Must have been busier then. <laughs> I suppose as, as we're all getting ready for swarming now, um, I suppose most of you have read the May edition of Beecraft, and there is a swarming checklist which you can follow. So well worth a read, and it uh, tells you how to uh, what to look out for when you uh, take a call to collect a swarm. So, how about yourself, Wendy? What, what will you be looking forward to in the next couple of weeks, and what will you be looking for in the bees? Well, sounds awful, but I'm actually looking forward to reducing my numbers of colonies. Um, I'm waiting for someone to, to pick up a number of my hives. I'm downsizing so that we can actually go uh, treat it more as a, a real hobby. Uh, we just got a bit out of control, so we want to reduce the numbers. And um, we're planning, and I'm not sure whether we will be doing it or not, to do colonies that we keep to Shook Swarm. We were hoping to do it in time for the uh, oilseed rape with the intention that they would then be able to draw out foundation. But um, we just got to review those plans as we go along, um, depending on what's what's going on. So that's really what I'm, I'm looking forward to enjoying my bees more rather than having to dash around and inspect them all and um, do everything that's necessary. And I, I feel as a result, I'll be able to look after the bees better. Mm. Um, so I'm looking forward to that very much. And I'm the opposite, actually. I, I've just taken on a new site and I'm looking to expand my numbers. Um, oh, I've still got some for sale, Rod. Oh, if you want any. <laughs> I'll be in touch. <laughs> okay, polystyrene Langstroth. I mean, I know you like polystyrene, so. No, that's great. Well, thank you very much. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up for this evening. Um, sorry if we couldn't get around to your question, but we'll... we'll uh, Ping that through to the to the experts, and uh, we'll get an answer through to your question. Um, and we look forward to uh, seeing you on our next hangout, which I believe is on the thirtieth of May. So, uh, good night from me.
Good night. Bye. Bye.